shot. Shall we begin? <laughs> so? <laughs> Right, let's, uh, let's begin. It's a great uh, pleasure to, to welcome you all to the inaugural uh, Michael Lipton lecture. Special pleasure to welcome Michael himself <laughs> at the front. Um, let me say a few words about Michael before introducing the speaker. Michael uh, joined Sussex in, in, in 1961 as one of the remarkable generation of uh, founding fathers, and with due apologies to modern sensibilities, they were all uh, at least not fathers, at least in, uh, indicatively qualified to be so, um, father figures of, of the university. Uh, already uh, with uh, many academic distinctions, the, the distinction of a, an All Souls Prize Fellowship, than which few prizes are more glittering in the uh, English academic firmament. Uh, he's been associated with Sussex, with variously with the Economics Department and with IDS, and for part of his career with both, uh, for over 50 years. Uh, Michael has conducted extremely influential work uh, with a, a focus on poverty, uh, different aspects of it, the, the optimizing peasant, urban buyers, village studies, role of technology and, and land reform, the role of, of demography. These are all extremely brief summaries of very distinguished contributions uh, to, um, to the area of, of um, development economics. And I think it's worth quoting uh, the, uh, from the citation of Michael's uh, election to another of uh, Britain's glittering prizes, Fellowship of the British Academy. Uh, one sentence, the combination of serious economic theory with detailed empirics and data assembly which his work displays makes this a model of what form research in this field should take. Yes, not just this field, but many other fields as well. And I like to think of that as the gold standard to which much of uh, research uh, at Sussex uh, aspires, not just the research of, of uh, faculty, but the, the important body of research undertaken by uh, successive cohorts of distinguished research students too. Uh, so uh, it's, it's very appropriate that Michael, your extraordinary contribution to economics and to the University of Sussex should be recognized with this, this lecture series. Uh, and it's very uh, appropriate uh, to invite young Willem Hunning to give the inaugural Michael Lipton lecture. Jan has been a professor of economics at the Free University Amsterdam, uh, having, having just about managed a close approximation to the pronunciation of your name, I'm not going to attempt <laughs> the, 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 the Dutch version of the university name. Um, he, he's been at the University of Amsterdam since 1987 uh, and a professor of development and economics since 1993. Uh, between 1998 and 2000, he led the Center for the Study of African Economics uh, at the University of Oxford, where he also uh, presumably earlier got his PhD. Um, he's uh, a fellow of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, has an honorary doctorate from the University of Auvergne for his leading role in studying the economics of Africa. I believe he's currently taking a, a career break, break uh, teaching mathematics at a secondary school in Amsterdam. Um, I, I, no doubt many of us would have much to gain were he to give us a refresher course <laughs> uh, in, 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 in high school mathematics. Uh, but it's probably more appropriate uh, for the, the Michael Lipton lecture that he, he um, talk about development economics. So it's a great pleasure to invite Jan Willem Gunning to talk about, as you see on the screen, the, this, the brass standard. Uh, I'm told that the lecture might uh, be for a, a, a little bit less than a standard uh, uh, academic hour, but there will be then plenty of time for questions and discussion. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It uh, is really, well, when I got the invitation, it wasn't labeled like that yet, but I'm certainly quite honored to uh, give the, uh, the first 
Michael Lipton uh, lecture. And uh, Michael, when I got into poverty, I think the, the very first book I read was yours on why poor people stay poor. So I'm, uh, I'm glad to recognize that. Um, if I, um, oh, shouldn't have done that. Um, Okay, okay. No, no. Here you are. Okay. But I want full screen. Yeah. There we are. Okay. If uh, um, it's, it's very good that I'm doing this in, Hol in, in the UK because you couldn't have possibly have done this presentation in Holland on that date because at the moment, December 5th, the whole country comes to a standstill. That is when the Dutch celebrate their version of St. Nicholas, which is completely different from what you're used to. And uh, one thing which didn't, well, people are still wrapping their presents, it's going to take the whole night. And one thing they have to finish, and they never finish on time, is their poems. Because you make fun of each other, and you do that by gently killing them in poems. It all has to rhyme, so people have to make these rhyming poems in the late afternoon of December the 5th. At my university, one year, professor really took this seriously, and when he had to uh, lecture on December 5th, he did the whole lecture <laughs> on rhyming, and I'm not going to uh, imitate that. <laughs> okay. Uh, the brass standard, so you will have guessed, just some other nail in the coffin of the, uh, of the RCTs. Uh, I will quickly go over uh, the uh, debate so far, which uh, most of you will probably know quite well, and then I'll uh, uh, focus on, on my particular uh, nail. And, and I will also suggest that uh, there is a problem, but there's also a solution. Um, okay, here we go. Um, of course, in development economics, people tend to forget that. But there's always been a, a very strong concern to establish the, uh, the impact of government policies. Um, but it has become a completely new industry with the introduction of RCTs. Uh, before that, I'm probably helping, I was in a real concern about the sort of regression analysis which uh, became uh, common in, in macroeconomics. Uh, the growth regressions, uh, I think, were a very bad example. Uh, people have now forgotten that, but there was a time, not very long ago, when you could get papers published in, in top journals which were just completely ordinary OLS, and it was clear that everything on the right hand side was endogenous, and nevertheless, you uh, got that published in the top journal. So uh, people got fed up. Then we got, of course, the, the stage of uh, IV estimates, and that is still very much with us, but people have become a bit skeptical about at least part of the instruments which have been advanced. So RCTs in economics came at a convenient moment when the uh, profession seemed to be a little bit at a loss of where to go. My reading is that the um, example of medical research has been very influential. Of course, RCTs are used in, in many fields, uh, but the analogy with medical research has become quite prominent in economics, <coughs> and I'm going to suggest to you that that is uh, quite clear. People know what drugs testing is. Uh, but also rather misleading, and I'm going to propose several ways in which the analogy uh, fails. So drugs testing, uh, you know, this is what you have to do when you have a great invention and you want to market it, say, in the US, you have to get FDA approval. Okay, so we've got a treatment group and a control group. The control group gets uh, a placebo, and uh, statistically, it's fantastically simple. We just have to establish whether there's a difference between the two, and whether that is um, statistically uh, significant. Okay, 
that is what we all know. You then know there's a, a, there's a very strange phase in which some people start to make truly extraordinary claims about what this type of research uh, does. And that has peaked. There's still some of that, but I think the most ridiculous claims which were um, quite popular some five years ago have um, now been overtaken by uh, uh, common sense, fortunately. Um, hold on. Okay, so uh, just to remind you, but most of this you know, will know this, uh, the random missiles uh, made uh, these, these outrageous claims, and I think these three statements best summarize their position. Um, so the first one is only RCTs can identify causal effects. Uh, the second one, which generated most heat, uh, is everything else is not worth studying. If the, if the question doesn't fit uh, that particular uh, method, then it really is not a scientific question, uh, as the Duflo said at one time. And the, I think the most interesting one is the results have external validity. And that is where the debate still goes on. We all know why internal validity is claimed for RCTs. I'm not going to spend much time on that, but even there you can put a question mark. But most of the discussion is, of course, on the external validity. And surely there it is. Some of the claims were completely over the top. Uh, so the unlimited, I'm not making up, that up. And this is a paper by uh, Energy and He, in which they claim that if you've got Many of you will know the paper. If you've ju got just one good paper on a topic, one of their examples is the effect of class size on learning. And the paper is the uh, famous Maimonides uh, rule paper in the QGE, I think. So, okay, so you have a nice regression, discontinuity design, very nice, and that is a convincing uh, paper showing causal effect uh, of, uh, of class size, and the outrageous claim is, since we have established that in a fairly peculiar context in Israeli school, and um, this can apply to the whole world, and particularly to the whole developing world, and they literally write the, uh, the World Bank should uh, use its entire education budget on the basis of that study. I'm not picking this up, so I'm, I'm just reminding you that there was a phase in which uh, common sense had, um, had been completely lost. Okay, <laughs> enough about that. Uh, the other side also exaggerated a little bit. I have a lot of time for Angus Deaton, but, um, uh, and that article, the gel article, is, uh, is a very, uh, very important paper, but even, even Angus Deaton sometimes says um, fairly ridiculous things, and this is very difficult to make sense of. Uh, the, the suggestion that there is no special ability at all seems to me um, very um, very strange. Now, Angus' real point is a is a quite serious one, and there I do agree with him. He said a lot of the problems with RCTs um, have to do with the selection of of samples, basically choosing the population. And his complaint against our field was that development economists very often spend very little time on that part of their research. Basically, you choose a convenient site. This is where you get some money or where you have a, uh, <coughs> um, a uh, government agency which is willing to uh, help you, and therefore that's where you're going to do your RCT. With very little thought given to the question whether that in any sense and encourages external validity. So basically, you've chosen a completely special uh, sample, and then you put a flag on it and say, well, this is the population. Okay. Very unlikely to be the uh, relevant uh, um, population. OK. And uh, that point is, it's valid. I think it's very important in practice. Um, it doesn't change methodology very much, because what is the implication of that criticism? 
it is that you should repeat studies in many different contexts. I'm completely in sympathy with that. It's a very boring message, but sometimes boring messages are entirely right in this is such a case. Um, here the um, medical analogy is useful to reflect on for a moment. Um, Deaton in his uh, Joe paper uh, refers to a drugs trial, which was set in a standard way, a nice randomized control uh, trial on a, uh, on a completely general uh, sample to test the drug which was actually meant for elderly patients. So the sample was not restricted to elderly people, and in, in, in fact, since it was completely random, they formed a very low percentage of it. So you tested on a general population, including children, and then the drug, ah, well, once approved, was used for the, uh, for the target group, which consisted then highly of elderly patients. And I'm, I'm quoting that example because the consequences were horrendous. A lot of these people died. And that wouldn't have happened if people would have given more thought to the design of the sample. In this case, obviously, again, <coughs> the message is boring, but it's important. Obviously, they should have made sure that the sample matched the target population, not the population. Okay, so this is one of um, Deaton's hobby horses. I think he's quite right. And I'm repeating the message because the uh, profession, um, of course, acknowledges the point, but it, in practice they haven't really taken it on board, and that's why I'm repeating it today. Okay, it's not a fundamental point, uh, but it is a point where I would argue that the usefulness of ICTs in development economics is damaged. Right? It simply hasn't. Uh, been given the attention it deserves. Okay, the um, this is a quote which many will of you will recognize because it comes from the uh, Banerjee and Duflo book. Poor economics, one of the strangest titles. I still don't understand why they call it poor economic. Uh, but okay, um, so this is what certainly got a lot of people uh, angry. Uh, namely, the claim that uh, uh, what most of us would consider as difficult but, but truly important questions, uh, you sh basically shouldn't waste your time on uh, because they, uh, they're not in the, the box of, uh, let us say, uh, fighting diarrhea. That is the box where you can use your RCT tools. Um, that... <coughs> Um, extreme position has been um, attacked, I think, quite effectively by, by, by people like Martin Revelian, uh, by Danny Roderick, and many of you will recognize that. Um, here again, I would make a comparison with what happens in medicine, where there's a similar situation. Lots of questions in the medical field where any doctor would say, no, I can't use an RCT. Um, and the implication, which is accepted in that field, but not yet in our field, is that we have different levels of evidence. This is a, a phrase used in medicine. <coughs> and sure, some of these levels, and they, they have a ranking, and they do put RCTs first, <coughs> some of these are better and more convincing uh, in establishing causal effects, but they don't draw the conclusion here suggested that the others don't deserve any attention. So this is a much more sensitive position where you say, okay, we can't do the best, I know for the moment, suggesting that RCTs are indeed the gold standard, <coughs> um, but we do want to address important questions which are not suitable for that job at all. Okay, so here I think the medical people um, have adopted a much more sensible attitude than the um, economics profession. The... Um, let me take you through some of the criticism. This one we've, we've discussed. Um, the um, external validity is still a very hot uh, topic. 
Uh, I've, I've already mentioned the, uh, the first paper, the Barnard and Heath paper, so that's the one with the extreme uh, position. Uh, people change. Uh, the Barnard change of the book is much more reasonable on this point. And so there's a big change in position. You don't find these, these, these uh, ridiculous statements about external validity in, uh, in the book. Um, here's an, a, a very different point, which is somewhat related to the point I'm going to stress later in this lecture. Um, Dietzen, again, in the Journal of Academic Literature paper, says, look, what may happen in practice is that what we consider the control group, that is the one which should not be exposed to the, uh, to the policy, in fact is changed. And one way that may happen is if we have different decision levels within government. So his example is a central government that takes a decision on, say, education and particular districts, and let's say Kenya are favored by that policy, but then a district officer, provincial officer, may say, well, come on, I, 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 I used to have a budget which I divided between all the districts, and now some of them are in a treatment group, so they, they, they don't need the special care, they are getting special care from another level, and therefore I'm, I'm going to reallocate my budget. Okay? Highly sensible. Um, but you see the problem, that uh, the control group no longer is a control group. As a result of the RCT, uh, districts, communities, whatever, the uh, unit of, of, of observation, um, which are supposed not to be affected, are in fact affected. Uh, the uh, implications are obviously quite serious because the, uh, you will now underestimate the, uh, the effect of the uh, policy and quite possibly you might erroneously conclude that the policy is ineffective when, if, if, when in fact it is effective. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's a possibility. So that criticism is really serious. And if you think of RCTs as a sort of a lab situation in which you completely control what happens, you don't need to worry. As soon as the uh, setting for the um, experiment, for the trial, becomes more realistic, so in my example, the, the actual decision makers are involved, including the district, district officer, then you have a real problem. Uh, this is one of the ways in which the medical analogy fails and because we, we're dealing with real people here, the people who are taking decisions, they're responding to um, the uh, experimental situation. Okay, um, a particular form of uh, the failing of um, external validity is problems with upscaling. And let me remind you, external validity is a bit vague as a term, but it simply means that I've tested something in a particular way, and I now claim that it's also um, uh, applicable in a different context. Now the question is, what do we mean by different context? Usually we mean a different population. So I've tested something in <coughs> Western Kenya, and I'm now going to claim that that is to everywhere in Kenya. I'm using that example because it, some years ago the Minister of Education for Kenya was getting quite fed up because all the RCT experiments in his country were in Western Kenya. And, and quite recently he said, I now know a lot about what works and what doesn't work in primary schools in Western Kenya, but I'm responsible for the whole country. So his, his uh, point was one of external validity, but external validity in a geographical sense. Um, the second interpretation of the term is, it's not the population, but the method of applying the uh, policy. And that is where upscaling becomes relevant. So it can be exactly the same population, we've made no change there, but in the RCT, the policy is applied in a very clean, very controlled uh, way, and when the thing is upscaled, becomes more realistic, it is applied in a different way. Then immediately the issue of, as you can see, the issue of 
external validity arises because we must now ask ourselves on what grounds can we extrapolate the ICT result to a situation which we actually change the game. Um, well, uh, to take a second paper, Tessa Bolt and her colleagues, they, uh, it's a wonderful example, a pretty shocking example. Uh, here, uh, uh, it's, again, it is education in Kenya, and the question was whether uh, using substitute teachers would improve the, uh, uh, sorry, but they were on temporary contract, would improve uh, learning outcomes, and the RCT said yes, it's quite a striking uh, improvement, and then the upscaling came, and what is wonderful about the paper is they did it in two different ways. So there were two arms in the, uh, in the extension study. <coughs> One was similar to the original RCT, that is the, uh, the, uh, the procedures were implemented by a uh, very dedicated uh, NGO. And the other was uh, the Kenyan government. And was there a difference? Yes, there was a difference. Basically, uh, the uh, policy didn't do anything in the second case, that is, if, the, if it was implemented by uh, the uh, uh, Kenyan government rather than by, by an NGO. So, uh, think a little bit about that. Uh, here we have a well-designed <coughs> RCT with a uh, suggestion of a big effect of a particular educational policy change, and if you then try to use that in a real world context that is implemented by the people who, whose job it is to implement these um, uh, educational policies, the thing falls completely flat. Okay? So external validity failed completely in this case. So this is a serious issue. Um, I'm going to spend the rest of my time on the last one, which is, I think, a slightly different uh, criticism. That's a point which um, uh, my colleague uh, um, Chris Elbers and I have been working on for a number of years and technically it's an issue of selection on the gain and I'll explain what I mean by that. Okay, so we are concerned about situations in which who benefits in the sense of who gets the policy is not directly controlled. That's different from the, again, from the medical case, because there you, everybody in the treatment uh, group gets the, uh, the real pill, or whatever it is, um, or if you want intention to treat, you offer everybody uh, uh, in that group um, that uh, possibility, and they can decide for themselves whether they uh, take it or not. Okay. Um, the situation we are concerned about is one in which the decision is partly based on an observables. <coughs> okay, so that, let me do it by an example. I call this the program officer situation. We have, let's say, an NGO, and they are going to uh, implement a program, say, uh, well, example here, typical uh, NGO pro, uh, program of, uh, of drinking water and sanitation. Uh, there is a, an initial selection on the basis of uh, criteria which the economician would call observables, for example, poverty targeting. So we're going to do it in districts which are very poor, or districts which don't have clean water, and so on. Quite obvious criteria, all of them are observables. The uh, economician can, uh, can just take these variables. Um, but that still leaves a lot of scope to a problem officer who is now going to go around and decide which, let's say, four or five villages within these broad criteria uh, he or she is going to select for treatment. And in that decision he will use, that is his expertise, he will use private information. That is, things which are unobservable to us, but he knows these villages. And he knows one is all hopeless, they're always very difficult people to work with, and in another one he expects a very big effect <laughs> of his policy, and therefore he is going to place the assignment in that village and a few others. Okay? So what is critical in this story is that he 
has some room for maneuver. The criteria of the organization are very broad, leaving him lots of discretion. And he uses that discretion to employ his private information on where the, um, uh, the program, the project, is likely to be most effective. I'll, I'll, I will put it later in more technical language, but that's basically the essence of the problem. I submit that in development, there are lots of situations like that. Not always like that, but many situations like that, where we have some very high level criteria like poverty targeting, but then beyond that, there are people who can take decisions where they may use private information. Um, the second example is a very common one. Any one in a bank, whether it's in a rich country or a developing country, will, will do exactly what I said. And he's got some criteria which are formal criteria of how much this person is already indebted, etc. That's an observable. But um, uh, since he knows the people in his village, he will have ideas about the likelihood of repayment, which to us as researchers, uh, constitute private information. So again, I'm not, go I'm not going to claim too much. There are lots of things in development which are not in this box, but I do submit there are quite a few cases. We should be worried about this situation and ask ourselves, what do our ICTs do in this case? Okay. Um, here I've got a very simplest case. So the first line says I've got some outcome measure, let's say household consumption, health, whatever, that's the Y variable, and uh, in this linear specification it's determined by only one thing, which is the uh, policy variable P, and P at the moment you can think of as a binary variable. In the paper it's a continuous variable, but that, that doesn't matter. So think of it as a binary variable. So the effect of the policy in, uh, in the population is simply uh, beta. The effect Y increases by, uh, by beta if uh, P takes the value 1 instead of 0. OK, uh, now the complications. I first introduced diversity, and I do that by saying treatment effects differ. Uh, uh, in ordinary language, that is simply saying that for some people, villages, whatever, the effect is greater than for than for others, and therefore the beta now has a subscript i. Okay, so I have treatment heterogeneity is the, is the, the jargon of the econometrician, but that's all it means. And the effect differs between individuals. In itself, that is not bad at all. If that's all there is, your regression is okay, your RCT is okay. Because what we will get is the expected value in the sample, but if the sample is big enough, we will get close to the expected value in the population, the expected value of beta. It is the expectation over i. It's precisely what you want to know as policymaker, because I'm going to throw P's around the country, that is, I'm going to assign some of you in this lecture hall values of one and others zero. And if I want to know what is the effect of that, it is the expected value. Do I have a whiteboard? No, I don't have a whiteboard. Okay. Uh, it's simply the effective, uh, expected value of the product of beta and p. That's it, because that's the total effect. Okay. And since p is, a, uh, is only 1 or 0, uh, I'm therefore interested in the expected value of beta. This is a long way of saying it's okay what you do, namely ignoring the diversity. We, we know that people are not identical in treatment effect, but it doesn't matter. In a moment, it will matter a great deal. But at the moment, it, I haven't introduced that yet. Okay, uh, it gets a bit more problematic when I introduce selectivity. Uh, that is, the uh, intervention is not universal, like saying, all kids have to go to school, and it's, uh, <coughs> it's not random. Those are the two cases where you can sort of escape trouble. Um, 
that uh, we can quickly rule these out. And very few programs are like that. I'm interested in this case, the assignment, that is the decision to give one of you the uh, value p equal 1, is now correlated with the beta. So what does that mean? Now we get the private information. I'm the program officer. I've got some idea about differences in effectiveness of a problem between villages or across individuals, say in a school. I think it will work better for this pupil than that pupil. And I base my decision on P on that private information. Okay. Then we've introduced a correlation, and some of you will recognize that as what Hackman calls essential heterogeneity. He calls it essential heterogeneity for a very good reason, and you cannot solve this in a standard way. It's a very simple proof, uh, which I cannot show you because I don't have a whiteboard, but many of you will know it. It's a one-line one proof, and that shows that any instrument you can think of must fail, because if it is correlated with the uh, thing you are now uh, instrumenting for, that is the P, uh, it must also be correlated with the error term. Therefore, I have a contradiction. Therefore, it's impossible. It's one of the nicest impossibility theorems I know. It's impossible to find an instrument. It's a truly important result. Uh, Heckman writes in a very dense way, but this is really <laughs> worth remembering. Okay, so in this case, we, our standard toolkit fails. Don't start looking for an instrument because you can show that it doesn't exist. Okay? Um, this is another way of looking at it in a much simpler way, saying, look, as soon as I've got that correlation, I've got this situation, I cannot break the term I'm interested in, which is this one. Remember, that is the effect of the policy. I cannot break it up like that into separate uh, 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 estimation, uh, uh, expected terms, and therefore the whole search for the expected value of beta, which is what most of the field is about, is meaningless. I literally mean meaningless. As soon as this is true, you may think that you have found the expected value of beta, and then what do you do with it? Because that doesn't answer any sensible question. The sensible question is this one. That's what you want to know. So this is where the, the field goes really wrong. You, you may find and you may think you found an answer, but that uh, is not going to help you for this reason. Okay. okay. The, uh, you will have guessed that RCTs are not going to work in this situation. Uh, it's a fundamental problem. RCTs you can think of as a, uh, as a form of an IV estimator. And if the IV fails, then the RCT is going to fail as well. The, uh, a, an easier way of expressing that is saying the RCT misses the essence here. Because the RCT is going to say, you get it and you <coughs> do not get the treatment, but the essence of the problem is that who gets it and who doesn't get it depends on characteristics which, by definition, are unobservable, and therefore the person doing the RCT cannot get it right. Okay? So it's really a fundamental uh, problem. Uh, I just said that. Okay. And that's my conclusion. You, you, you get a correct answer, but it's still to a completely irrelevant question. You don't waste time on this. As, as, as soon as you recognize that you're in this case, uh, trying to do a, uh, an ICT doesn't make sense. Now, if I were a uh, randomista, and I would say, come on, you are overstating your case because I am obviously not stupid. I understand the problem you're sketching, but in that particular situation, I wouldn't randomize over beneficiaries. That is, uh, to go back 
to my original example, the beneficiaries were villagers, and the uh, RCT advocate would say, come on, I'm, she would say, I'm not <coughs> going to uh, make this stupid mistake by randomizing all the villagers. I realize what you're saying is discretionary power of program officers, and therefore, I must go one level higher. That's a very clever answer. So he now says, I can solve the problem by changing the level of aggregation. I do not randomize at the level of beneficiaries, affiliate villages, but uh, at the level where the decisions are actually taken, the problem is. That sounds right. And for a long time, I thought it was right, um, but it isn't. The first, uh, the first point is obvious, you, you lose a lot of statistical power, depending on the situation, but you may have a quite a small number of program officers, so you're now uh, trying to rest your case on a very small number of observations, and you've basically thrown away lots of information. The second reason is much more serious. The, um, it's very unlikely that uh, the characteristics of the program officers are totally independent, are uncorrelated with your controls, which also affect the outcomes. <coughs> For example, program officers of, let's say, nationally operating control <coughs> will be distributed over the country in a particular way. Not randomly. Well, it would be nice if it were random. But no, no NGO is going to say, how are we going to assign 10 program officers over Kenya? Let, let's do it by randomizing. No, of course not. So they will say, and uh, we believe, for example, they will use language, and they will say we need someone with lower language in the west of the country, Kikuyu in the central province, and so on. But very likely, many of these criteria are used simultaneously and many of them will be in the third year. And we're back to square one. We cannot mimic that process. And the whole idea of an RCT is that the assignment mimics what happens in the real world. And the big message I want to leave with you is there are situations in which that is unlikely or impossible. This is a case where if you think you've solved the problem by going more level higher, then you hit a new problem, and that is that these uh, program officers are not then in the allocated of the space, and therefore I get a new type of correlation which introduces a bias. Okay? Again, if it's only one thing, it doesn't matter. For example, if the program in the real world is very much targeted to a particular area of the country, then you can easily deal with that. If it is a large number of, to, to repeat it, it's a large number of criteria used simultaneously, and some of these involve observables, then that's the end of the story. Okay? So I'm, I'm stating it as clearly as I can, um, and I'm not claiming that that happens all the time. I am suggesting that there are quite a few situations in developing economics where you should be quite worried about what I now call the program officer case. Um, okay, so that sounds pretty bad. And uh, indeed it is pretty bad. Uh, the fact that the question is, what are we going to do about it? Uh, that's not right, is it? No, it's Dutch time. Okay. Um, okay. Um, no, because I do want to uh, finish that one. Um, I'm going to uh, sketch you a method which uh, will deal with this problem, so that's helpful. Uh, you will not like it because it involves observational data. We've been taught, that's a recent development, we've been taught that observational data are suspect, uh, they cannot uh, deal with causality, there are all sorts of things wrong with them, and I'm going to um, 
sort of a little bit against the stream and saying, well, that may be true, but there are situations in which you better use observational data. I hope I've convinced you now that there is a non trivial case in which RCTs are really no good at all. Okay, here we are. Uh, yeah, in this case they can do the trick, and that I, is what I have to show you, and now I'm afraid I do have to use a little bit of algebra, but don't, the next sheet looks horrible, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, okay. Let me, no, let, let's do it in stages. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Um, I've now slightly uh, complicated the model. I've introduced controls X, but it's still a linear uh, effect. And I'm, I've now addressed one set of issues by taking differences. So it's, have we been in a double difference in Wolf, and I've already expressed the left-hand variable as a, as a change in the outcome variable. So on the right-hand side, there's changes in X and changes in the, uh, in the P variable. Okay. The concern, so I've, I'm, I've rewritten that now in the second line, because that is what happens in a regression. You're actually uh, taking um, conditional expectations, and the conditional expectation I'm worried about is the one in the middle, because we now know that uh, beta is correlated with uh, p, or here with uh, delta p, and possibly also with delta x. In either case, I've got a problem. Okay, that's just repeating the definition of the problem. <coughs> here, this is the trick. We say, okay, let us suppose that that relationship between these three can be approximated by this linear approximation. It doesn't have to be linear. If you want to, any point of polynomial will do, but you will quickly run into degrees of freedom problems. So I've restricted myself to the linear case, but there's now fundamental reason for doing so. Okay, so I'm now writing the beta, which I don't know, as a uh, linear <coughs> function of the uh, changes in x and and, and P, which I can observe, okay? So that's, the, that's, of course, the trick. I've now made a move from something which I can't observe to something which I can. And that's basically all there is, because I've then substituted that into the original equation, uh, which now looks a little bit messy, but uh, you can see nothing much changes in addition to the standard terms of delta X and delta P I now have these two cross products, okay? The, uh, yes, that's what it is. And that is a form in which I can estimate it. And the uh, uh, endogeneity is now removed. These very, in this form I can estimate the equation and I can then recover what I want. On the left hand side, that is what we call the total program effect, but the total program effect is nothing other than that expectation of uh, beta times p, that is the effect in the population weighted by how much p I give people. So that's exactly what we want. Okay, I will have these estimates, the OLS regression will give the estimates of these uh, theta coefficients, the theta hats, and I will plug in the um, um, sample means of the uh, regressors. It's very helpful at this stage if your sample is representative for the relevant population, and we can tell them these are good estimates for population uh, and means, and then <coughs> I've got it. <coughs> so I've now done something very strange. The was an endogeneity problem which um, really stopped RCPs for the reason indicated by Peckman. And we return to regression and evade the problem by that substitution which I indicated here. Okay, that's basically the story. So, message one, <coughs> that there are fundamental issues in cases which are quite likely to occur in development and Message two, don't start crying because there is a solution, but then you have to move away from RCTs and be willing to return to 
observational data. Okay, this is better. I don't know. That is an empirical question. It might well be that this is sort of the thing which excites researchers, but it's completely unimportant in practice. Uh, we've, we've tried to do it uh, in, in the uh, article which I'm now discussing by looking at a uh, health insurance program in Vietnam, and we've done it both ways. The traditional way, it basically it didn't take its false effects into uh, the, uh, the cross products into account, and the one where we correctly estimated the total problem effect. In this case, the effect is huge. But the measure here used for health effects was body weight, I think, and the change in body weight was twice as much if you did it uh, the correct way. Uh, therefore, her conclusions could really change. This is a situation in which by ignoring that you you might have concluded that insurance problem is a waste, it doesn't achieve what you hoped in terms of health changes, whereas in fact, if you did it correctly, uh, there was a big change. Of course, I'm not claiming any generality of result. No, no difference in the group. I am claiming that it's very easy to check because uh, that's the last line. And basically, all I've advocated is that you add a few terms in your regression. There's a long story about it, but that's all that uh, was going on. And therefore, you can easily do a, uh, a test for joint significance whether that makes a um, makes a, a real difference or not. I advocate that people do that test in a standard way. Testing for whether heterogeneity in the sense I have defined it matters is very easy to do. It should actually become standard. And um, then we know whether we're making mistakes. And perhaps in many cases, many applications, there is no problem, but the Vietnam data suggests it's at least something you should worry about. Okay, let me conclude because then we have some time to conclude for discussion. Um, so I do claim that uh, there are a lot of situations which I've summarized as the program officer case, but which technically is the, the correlation of assignment and treatment effect. Um, you now know that uh, it's no trying to solve that with um, uh, IV estimates simply makes no sense for reasons long ago indicated by uh, Heckman, and RCTs are also going to go wrong. And I've stressed again and again that uh, RCTs focus on a variable, which in this case is completely irrelevant, so don't do that. Uh, but that's the variable which you do want to know, which is that, that one, the uh, total program effect, can be estimated. And you can do that econometrically in a very simple way with OLS, <coughs> which you have to use a, a rather unusual specification. That's the message. Thank you very much. <laughs>
will not be covered. That is what I mean. What the researcher does is, is untimely. So as such a woman call it bias, uh, which this is just the nature of the problem. And, the, and that, if you like, is targeting. It's, it's, it's a particular form of targeting. Everything we do in development has for that. The question is, are, are the characteristics of the control different? And no, that I haven't introduced that in the story, and you don't need that. The, uh, the two could be entirely the same. And I'm hesitating because the concept of treatment and control both now becomes fake. And so you have to discuss about what you mean by that. Um, so the easiest answer is to say within the treatment group, some will now not be treated. Within the control group, everybody will be treated. So if I set it up as an that's exactly what we have. Half the sample has no treatment at all. In the other half, you tell the problem officer, if you like, do what you want to do. And he or she will, in some cases, uh, treat, or should be intentionally change offer treatment, and in some cases, he won't. And that, in the story, focuses on how does he take the decision, partly on the basis of the answer. Sorry. But isn't, isn't that exactly what a medical randomized control trial is supposed not to do, in the sense that it's supposed to be double blind? Neither the researcher nor the research has any idea who is in the treatment group and who is in the control group. Now you may say, well, still, the researcher can select, the, the doctor can say, we won't include people with kidney disease in this particular trial or something like that. That can't happen. But then that is, apart from that, there is a uh, total blinding until the final results are published. You don't know. And that way you also avoid the effect on the person being, not only the effects you've described, but also the also serious effects on the person being investigated. But if they know the treatment, if they perk up and are likely to show better results. Now maybe one of the things wrong with social RCTs is that they can't or don't do this double blind procedure. Okay. That was a whole series of questions. Um, and let me try to remember now. On, on your very last point, um, that does happen. There are now attempts or papers which basically try to introduce the uh, double blindness. Uh, so there is, for example, a paper in which people introduce fertilizer, but to address the point you're making, uh, you, you, you get it back, but you're told that there may be good fertilizer in it, or basically a placebo, which is good lousy fertilizer. Okay, so there are people um, trying to address the point of blindness. And I'm glad to raise it because I've forgotten to mention that it, it is one of the big differences. But the, uh, you're quite right. That in medicine, people insist on the double blindness, um, which also has its limits. And at some stage, the surgeon has to know whether he actually has to cut off your leg or not. But um, uh, yes, basically, you can do it. Uh, and in, in economics, that's quite rare, but it's beginning to be used. Now my real answer. My real answer is uh, no, it doesn't solve the problem I sketched, because if you do a real double-blind thing, you, you don't tell the problem officers who's in front of them. So, okay, that is, uh, that is nice in some way, and the village or the, or the, the school child doesn't know and what, uh, what teacher they put in front of them. You can arrange that. That's fine, but then you get what I've earlier called the correct answer to an irrelevant question. Because once you want to use that as a kind of policy, you're in trouble. Because in, in the real world, we don't go to that like that. You pay <coughs> off the, uh, uh, the blinding, and you, you know full well. So it's that wrong what you don't get. Because the result you now get is going to be tied by someone who immediately refers to his type, which is, I'm going to use private information. So I'm going to ask that question if that really doesn't work. Very 
first time conditional on the differences in the y's being additive and separable and the differences in the x's and the differences in the b's. Yep. Right? Yep. Okay, then, then, I, then the rest follows. Yep. But, so in what sense is this a common problem that we have that, that particular first line, that, that it's valid to, to be progressing the differences in the y's on the differences interactions and the potential for interactions to do identification of cause and effects. Um, so I, the third question is really a, a more open-ended question, but I, I'm struggling to relate this because okay, let me start. a section on, on yeah. using interaction effects to do this. So sure. disagree. Okay, I'm not sure I, I can handle the third one, so let me start with the second one. The, um, the, the total program effect I think is the obvious question to ask. I, 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 I like your response, but it seems to me that that is what you want to know as a policy maker. And, um, let's step, I'll slightly complicate things. I've introduced the binary case, so, so P is either one or zero. But let's say uh, it's a continuous variable, which is for many policies is the case. I give more or less time to a pupil, say. Um, now, isn't, to, to stick with that example, isn't precisely what you want to know? I've given you so many hours, you so many hours. In your case, per hour, it was beta i. In your case, it was beta j. And I do want, if I'm so indifferent between individuals, I want an unweighted average of that, which is precisely what I'm claiming. There may be distributional reasons which would change that story, so let me make that a footnote. Uh, but otherwise, I am claiming that a, um, what you want to know if you're assessing impact is what I call the total program effect. I don't think there's debate on that. I do think that people normally don't phrase it like that because they, um, hold on, where was it? Uh, because they have a situation like this in mind, and um, I mean it's, it's pedantic to talk in those terms because it's so easy to talk about the expectation of beta, and then later we multiply by the number of cases we've treated. Uh, but so that factoring is probably what has conditioned all of us to think as if this is what is the holy veil. There's no such thing. That is the holy veil. Um, sorry, that was your question too, I think. Question one, um, yes. Um, well, I, the, the equation one is no more than what it says. Um, and, and you're quite right in saying that that is limited in, in various ways, that it didn't in reality and so on. Um, the only thing I submit to my defense is that this is typical, typically, if you ask an RCT person to write down a model, that's the sort of thing they write down. But this, it's a weak defense, but I'm, I'm not sort of from another planet. This is the... Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking that, I mean, when we teach first level in one of the things we tell the students is we're often interested in y t minus 1 on the right hand side. Okay. And then we, we're not constraining as you're doing here that the difference between y i t and y i t plus 1 is going to be 1. Okay. So, 
Okay. So we quickly agree on that. Yeah. Sorry. This, um, um, uh, if you want uh, T subscript uh, variants, I can give them to you. Yeah, no, we agree. This is for uh, expositional purposes only. Sorry, what, what, what changes between well, the two? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, what, what... The first thing we tell our students when we teach econometrics is if, if you have t minus, y t minus 1 on the right-hand side, and you're estimating a coefficient on it, and it isn't necessarily 1, which it's forced to be 1 here, then, you know, this isn't a very general model, i.e. under what circumstances, I'm asking you, under what circumstances <laughs> are you interested in developing economics in a world where this particular simple Yes, I, I, uh, I think we fully agree. I, uh, I, I admit that that is a, a limitation. It obviously is. Um, I do repeat that um, this is what happens in the field. That, that is a weak defense, as I've already said, but I'm addressing what happens in the field. And if you then say, but that is a pretty constricted universe, yeah, we quickly agree. <laughs> Your point is well taken, and I'm not going to my, argue with my, it. My second point, I want to come back to slightly, because um, obviously in a, in a room where there's lots of development on this, I'm sure that you know, many of you are very, very interested in sort of total program effects. Okay. So as, as advising policymakers, you'll be interested in the total impact of a particular policy. But there are lots of other situations. Okay, okay, now I understand you, and I agree. The, as usual, the, 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 the big issue is getting the question right, and, and yes, so for the, <coughs> the question I was addressing, um, and there's no disagreement on that, is what would the policymaker want to know? I do not disagree with what you say, I mean that there are other questions to which this is not the answer, but it's obviously true. Um, L let me, because now remember, but I said at the beginning there are fundamental differences between um, RCTs in, in, in medicine and economics. Uh, one is the blinding uh, point which uh, uh, Mac introduced. Another one which is slightly related to what you just said is that in medicine they make a clear distinction between proof of principle and what happens in practice. Proof of principle doesn't matter what something you've got. I mean, the drug is supposed to be for the elderly, but you better have a thought of elderly, but otherwise you basically try to see if penicillin works. And that's the only conclusion you draw from that. And we then jump, we economists, um, then tend to jump to the conclusion, ah, but if that's the case, if I've established proof of principle, then I can go on. Striking example is, is uh, his AIDS. So, when we early on in the epidemic, the tobacco uh, final treatment was discovered, that was tested in the sense which I call proof of principle. Yes, it seems to work. People don't die anymore. And that is a good example because rolling it out in Africa gave very different effects because it wasn't taken as intended, and for very good reasons. People who have AIDS shared the drugs with their brothers, friends, etc., uh, totally reducing the uh, ineffectiveness. And it's a very different point. But the one point is proof of principle. The other one, what is, is, is a TPE point? But what is the effect in practice? So uh, 
Yes, horses for horses. They're, they're different problems. Yes. Then you can get one of these thetas on the bottom line, the one which is interacted with, sorry, the theta 3, which is interacted on the group. Uh, That's right. But the aged would have a very different yes. size and sign than the others, in, in which case you are pinpointing the nature of, you know, conditional on X. And you, you would pick it up yeah. here so when you did it George Significant. In your case, because I okay. think in that particular okay. circumstance, conditional on your first line, okay. then your last line is actually really quite predictable. Okay. taking um, expectations in two groups where the calculated mean depends on the distribution of the beta that was in the answer. Um, and so if I plot big uh, samples, so we can do a sample error, that distribution is going to be the same. That's what you think. But in your control group, If a problem is effective because the program officers were implemented, are very good in uh, allocating scarce resources in such a way that the high betas get the high P's, we should rejoice. And the DP will pick that up because it is a weighted effort, whereas the RCT will make the blunder that it tries to uh, imply that the homogeneity.
Since, since RCTs became very popular, we've been we focusing on benefits and trying to prove <coughs> that benefits are positive. Uh, if you go back to sort of the mid 1960s, people would have been astonished developing this post-surgical <coughs> benefit analysis, and people would have said it's completely nuts to, to say this is a good policy because the benefits are positive without any expression of cost. I think we have to recover that field. That is really, uh, we're not taken seriously. Say I know I, I, I know a very effective education uh, program, and, and you get the question: So how much does it cost? And you say I haven't looked at that. Uh, no, uh, that, uh, sorry, that will, uh, the differencing will take, will do part of the trick, but you still have, uh, what have I done now? Um, um, so what's not differenced out is the differences in the beta. It's, be, it's beta subscript i, that's the point. And that it doesn't disappear in the sort of double digit uh, combination. And that's well, indeed the essence of it. <coughs> that that is a relevant case, and I, I don't want to overstate this, but at least in, uh, where people have split samples to look at heterogeneity, <coughs> um, they often come up with pretty, pretty, pretty big effects, so which we should worry about. And I've, I've shown you that if, if in the real world people respond to these differences, that's the problem of the system, you really have a problem. Thank you very much. I'm sure you'd all like to join with me in, in, in thanking the member and doing very warmly, not just for an excellent lecture and discussion, but for participating in the research student workshop. It's a very important event for the department and a very important feature of it is having external scholars come along to, to listen to stimulate our students. So thank you very much for what you've done. All <laughs>